The next speaker, right now we are waiting for the last and final keynote speech and final panel discussion. And I would ask you to give one name to one of the best coffee shops in Scandinavia, a professional consultant, one of the best European and world roasters, a 2004 World Barista Champion, 2005 World Cup Tasting Champion, and, as of a couple of years ago, a coffee farmer and producer in Colombia. Who would that be? Yes, it's Tim. Please, everyone, welcome Tim Venlebo on the stage <laughs> to talk about perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, sounds like I'm, I'm a really smart guy, but I'm really not. <laughs> uh, uh, I actually don't have a high education or anything, so uh, it's just a coincidence that I've been fortunate enough to work in many kind of aspects of the industry. And uh, it's actually my 20th anniversary in coffee this month, uh, which is not as near as 150. <laughs> and uh, you can ask yourself, 20 years, but he just looks like he's 20. But, um, <laughs> you know, coffee keeps you very young, at mind at least. Um, I, I don't feel like I'm an expert in any kind of field. Uh, I kind of feel that I'm more of a generalist, so I'm not going to talk to you about a certain topic or anything today. It's just I'm, I thought I would give you a little bit of uh, insight to my career and uh, what I've learned so far in 20 years. So let's do this. <laughs> See, nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm standing behind this, uh, you know, to hide my belly. But um, yeah, my career started in 1998 uh, by coincidence. Um, I was done with high school, I think you call it in English, and uh, didn't want to study because I'm a person who doesn't like to do what everyone else is doing. I kind of make it a sport into not doing what everyone else is doing. And all my friends were going to university to study, so I thought, that's not what I'm going to do. Um, and then I started looking for a job, and I thought I wanted to work in a bar, because in bars you have pretty girls, and you make a lot of tips, and you get to drink for free, uh, which were three things that I really enjoyed. <laughs> uh, but I was only 19, and uh, the problem was you had to be 21 to be able to work in a bar. So. Um, the job that I could get was in a cafe at daytime. So I passed the window downtown and it said, we're hiring. I applied for the job. Uh, they needed two people full time the day after. And I was one out of two uh, applicants. So I got the job. <laughs> That's how that started. I actually didn't drink coffee. I didn't like coffee um, because, you know, uh, most of the times coffee doesn't really taste good, to be honest. Uh, I would say maybe 99% of the coffees that I've been offered outside of a specialty coffee shop doesn't taste pleasant. So no reason, uh, that's the reason why I didn't like it, I guess. So I started learning. Um, you know, back then we didn't have a great deal of resources, but we had a great deal of problems that we didn't know how to solve. And then I researched and then I found this guy. I don't know if you know him. Well, he's the world-famous David Schomer out of Vivace, uh, Café Vivace, I think it's called, in Seattle. This guy had all the solutions to all my problems. So I considered him a guru. And if you look at him today, uh, that's when I start to feel old, because he looked much younger 20 years ago, that's for sure. Um, but David Schomer taught me something very important, and that was to um, separate uh, and kind of um, uh, organize everything that I did in order to make a good cup of coffee. So before, I was just told, you know, you go to the grinder, you do two clicks and you get some coffee out in the filter, you put the filter in, and then 25 seconds later you have a perfect espresso. That's what we thought. But then uh, I realized, you know, the espresso rarely tasted good, and when it did, I, didn't, I couldn't tell why it tasted good. I didn't know what I had done. David Schomer taught me that kind of methodology of separating, okay, is it your water filters? Is it your grinder burrs? Is it your espresso machine? Is it the pressure, the temperature, and so on? So I uh, experimented uh, a lot. Let's see if this works. Um, 
I was testing different machines, different pressures, different grinders. Uh, we were at the start of uh, the internet, believe it or not. Um, I got my first computer in 1998. And so we could start to find forums where we could discuss, you know, whether or not to tamp 10 kilos or, you know, all these kind of really important things. Um, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> in, in sum, I, I learned so much in such a short time uh, that I really believed, remember I was, you know, in my early 20s, I truly believed that I was the world's best barista. Very humble. And then it wasn't until 2001 when I competed in the World Barista Championship and I didn't win. And you can see how happy I was. Because <laughs> in my head, I, I knew much more than the guy next to me, Mr. Fritz Storm, who actually won. I knew much more about coffee, or at least preparing coffee, than him. That's what I thought. So that really got me thinking, and I actually was kind of depressed after this, uh, because I had worked so hard for it. It was in Oslo, so my whole family was there to watch. And, you know, everyone knew that I would, was going to win, but then it didn't happen. So I realized, you know, I've been so focused on myself, maybe I should take a step back and have a look, why didn't I win? And one of the comments that I got from some very honest but very helpful judges was, was that my coffee didn't taste good. And I thought, you know, why? You know, I was told by my boss that the coffee that we buy is the best coffee in the world. <laughs> Sounds familiar? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was using a blend that mainly consisted of past crop old Brazilian coffee, which was great because you could buy a lot of it and keep it for a long time and it would be very stable in quality. <laughs> It was some uh, monsoon Malabar that later on I learned that that actually wasn't the real monsoon Malabar, it was fake, so it was just some moldy Indian coffee. <laughs> uh, we had some monsoon Robusta, we had some uh, triage, which means broken beans, and so on. But it was a little bit lighter roasted than the other coffees on stage, so you know I thought it was good, but of course you tasted more of that coffee and more of the horrible stuff, so my coffee wasn't good. So I looked to uh, where to learn, and uh, the only w w place to learn, for me at least, uh, in Europe, was Italy. Because uh, espresso culture was very new in Norway. Um, it had just started around 1996. Um, so the only place that I thought that I could learn more about roasting and coffee was to go to Italy. Little did I know that uh, Italy was a kind of a universe on its own. Many, many different opinions, many, many different roasters, and a lot of bad coffee. But I did find a couple of uh, really, really uh, knowledgeable companies and knowledgeable people. And I have to say that when visiting Italy was uh, an experience that I had never uh, never actually experienced again the how methodology they were so method how do you say systematic and uh, were using science in order to improve the quality of their coffee so I thought you know I, I can try to do the same as a small company well I didn't have a company but I was still roasting a little bit so I went back home and I started roasting I st took samples of all the coffee bags that were in the storage of uh, Solberg & Hansen, which is the kind of the company that I was working with back then. They wouldn't allow me to roast coffee, but my old mentor, he said, you know, Tim, just come with me to the coffee lab and I'll show you how the sample roaster works, which was an old Probat sample roaster from the 1960s. And uh, then I, he gave me the sampler, you know, the little stick you put into the bags, and I went down to the warehouse and I took samples of all the different bags that were there, roasted it and tasted it and I couldn't taste the difference. <laughs> Maybe not because I was a bad taster, but because the coffees weren't that good, to be honest. This was the early 2000s. And then the same year, some 
really, really special coffees started coming into the roastery. Uh, some couple of excellence coffees from specific farms. It wasn't a Colombia, you know, Excelso. It was from Finca La Esperanza from Colombia. And then I could start to notice that the coffee could actually taste something other than the coffee flavor, which was great. So with all this work that I did, uh, it resulted in 2004. I was back in Trieste and I finally won the competition. And look how happy I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought, you know, that I would kind of use that title for the rest of my life, which I guess I'm doing right now. But um, I didn't realize until afterwards that um, what was more important was it was more like a key to all the doors that I was locked before I won the competition. So I was invited here uh, right after the competition and I learned a great deal from the Proba team about, you know, more than just sample roasting, but there are other types of roasters and, and uh, companies uh, that are doing great stuff outside of my little sphere. Uh, I was able to travel to Russia, to the US, to Australia, wherever, and wit witness very different coffee cultures, uh, maybe not always to my liking, but still high quality coffee cultures. And I realized the more that I kind of shared of my knowledge, the more people would also share of their knowledge. So in my uh, opinion, this has been the greatest learning experience in my career is that if you share something, you always get something back. So in 2007, I decided to take the big step. I left the company I was working for and uh, decided to buy an old UG15, uh, which was a beautiful machine that served me for many years. Unfortunately, it's gone now, but let's not talk about that. We're at the Probat factory. Um, but I was fortunate to, to actually uh, start my own company. Uh, my old employer lent me money to invest. And I found a little kind of space in the side streets of a small neighborhood where I could basically be left alone. I had one seat in my cafe, but it was reserved for my 92-year-old grandfather. Uh, so it was not a very welcoming cafe at, in the beginning, but I really enjoyed it because I could do, you know, a lot of testing. I could roast and taste, and we had cuppings every day, and you know, there was no customers in the store. It was beautiful. <laughs> But then I realized, you know, we were spending so much time testing. Testing different uh, temperatures on our espresso machine, different pressures, different grinders, different roast profiles. Testing, 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 testing. Still my coffee didn't taste good. And then I got a visitor, uh, an exporter, who came from Ethiopia. And he had brought some uh, coffee samples for us to taste. And uh, we tasted them blind on the table. And uh, I brought my coffee from Ethiopia, and there was one coffee on that table that really, really tasted awful, and it was my coffee. And I was so shattered because I'd spent so much time working on the roast profile and so on. His coffees were just in a different league. And partly because of the green coffee, it was much better, but mainly because the roast was just, you know, so different. And then I realized, you know, I had been focusing on a very, very small window, playing around with roast profiles, where the real good stuff was all over here. You might say I was playing in the, in the wrong ballpark or something like that. So I started pushing the limits of how light could I actually roast and to many, uh, I would say, American friends' uh, frustration. Uh, my coffees tasted like uh, grass a lot and hay and so, so on, but you know, we were trying to figure it out. And, once we kind of started to, to find the style that we preferred, um, I realized, you know, the coffee still didn't taste so great. And I had to figure out why. And of course, the reason was uh, the green coffee was not so good. I was, you know, just buying through mainly importers and nothing wrong about importers, but the availability of the green coffee back then was very, very small. Today, it's a whole different story. So I had to start going to uh, origin, of course, because I didn't really understand why my coffee didn't taste so good. Because, you know, it was a coffee maybe from a couple of excellence farm, 
but still it didn't taste good. It might taste woody and so on. And that's a big problem for me. And then I listened to um, to uh, uh, a lecture at the Nordic Barista Cup um, from one of the greatest chefs that is still uh, around, or he's very much around. His name is René Redzepi. He has a world-famous restaurant, Noma, in Copenhagen, and is by many considered one of the greatest chefs in our decades. Uh, he had a lecture at this forum, and he said, you know, as a chef, I spend maybe 10% of my time working in the kitchen, but I spend 90% of the time working with the producers that we're buying produce from to make sure my food is great. And I thought, you know, I spend 100% of my time in my coffee shop trying to make my coffee taste better, and 0% on the coffee farm trying to improve the quality there. And yet, if I get a bad green coffee, it doesn't matter what I do in my store, it won't taste good anyway. So he inspired me to start going to farms and uh, to learn. And then I realized, you know, there's, there's good coffee and then there's uh, really good coffee. And uh, you could clearly see the difference, if this is working, uh, between the two. Um, and from all my travels, I went to Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Brazil. You, st you start picking up small things that you think, you know, you try to relate maybe the drying tables in Kenya, to the coffee not fading very fast, so it's tasting fresh for a longer time, and so on. And I thought, you know, maybe I could start implementing this on other farms. Um, so I decided uh, around 2010, 11, to try to find a, a small group of producers that I could work with long term, not just, you know, pay them a visit, buy the coffee, next year if the coffee didn't taste good, I will buy from their neighbor, and so on. I thought, you know, maybe I should start thinking a little bit more long term and find partners that mm, maybe not have the best coffee at the moment, but have potential of growing the best coffee. This is uh, Elias to the left. Uh, he looks a little bit like Maradona, I know, but um, I, I'm, uh, I'm assuring you he's a coffee farmer. And my friend Diego, he's a barista champion of Colombia. He's used to translate for me. And now he doesn't have a job anymore, for me at least, because I kind of understand Spanish a little bit more. But we started working with Elias uh, in order to improve the quality of his coffee and thinking of it as a long-term project. We knew that you know, just by improving the picking and processing, maybe we could improve the coffee a little bit, but uh, we have to think long-term uh, in order to, to change something in, in a big way. So just to take you uh, through what I mean by improving quality, uh, the first thing, of course, would be improving the picking itself, which is probably the most difficult part, because you're dealing with people who are picking by hand, and they don't like to pick slow, because they can make more money if they pick more volume. So you have to pay them more, you have to train them, you have to control that they're doing the job that they're actually supposed to do. And uh, believe me, picking coffee is not a nice job. It's really, really hard. And then we would implement hand sorting, um, which means you just basically pick out the bad coffees. Uh, I've researched uh, different drying methods. So over the years, we've tried to dry the same coffee on patios, in uh, mechanical dryers, and raised beds, and so on. And I've found that you know, by increasing the drying times and lowering the bean temperature during drying, you can actually increase the shelf life with over a year, which means even if the coffee isn't the best coffee when you buy it, it will stay the same quality for the whole period. And I'd much rather have that than a really high scoring coffee that got, gets woody after two months. So some of these things have been really important uh, to learn and how to understand the coffee quality and um, lot separation, for instance. It doesn't make sense for a lot of farmers because they will, in Colombia, they will pick the coffee, dry it, take it to the marketplace and sell it. They don't keep it or taste it or anything. That's the way they, most of the farmers work. And I was asking Elias, you know, pick the coffee, dry it, store it until I've tasted it, and then we can put them together, the good ones, and then we'll get rid of the bad ones, and then we'll pay you a good price for it. So all this work, mm, 
we kind of spent uh, just a week actually just to systemize the farm and, and do all this kind of extra work. We paid a much higher price to the pickers. We paid a much higher price for the coffee. The problem was the coffee still didn't taste good. And uh, again, I was focusing on small details that matters, but doesn't make the big change. So what we're looking at now is uh, changing the varieties on the farm. I'm not saying his varieties are bad, they're just not great for his area. Uh, so we're trying uh, many different traditional varieties, but also new hybrids to see if we can increase the quality uh, over time. And we're seeing some great results. But it kind of felt like I was, you know, you're paying so much attention and work into many, many, many small details, yet you don't see the results that you want to see. Uh, and that's kind of frustrating, I think. Um, one of the most important things that I've learned by working on these farms is that it doesn't really matter um, what your intention is, how ripe the coffee cherries are on the tree, you know, the bricks reading in the cherries or whatever makes you go off. <laughs> it doesn't really matter um, and doesn't help the quality if you don't treat the workers on the farm uh, with respect. Uh, because if you don't, they're not going to give you quality work. So you can say that you want to pick ripe cherries, and I've probably never been to a farm where they don't say they only pick ripe cherries. But in reality, if you look at the cherries and sort them, a lot of times, you know, maybe half of the cherries are unripe or overripe. But it's really, really difficult to get the workers to commit to this unless they get the right, right incentives. And the only incentive for them, they're there to work and to earn money. You have to pay them more. Hence, you have to also pay more for the coffee. One of the other things that I learned on the, by working with farmers is that I, I have to admit that I have maybe paid a little overpriced for some of the coffees that I'm buying. And, and the intention for that has been to, to try to lobby for them to invest more in you know, new processing equipment, new dryers, uh, infrastructure that will help the quality, you know, more fertilizer for the coffee trees maybe, or plant new varieties. And with Elias, I've been doing this since the beginning, so from 2012, when we first started buying coffees. We, I knew I couldn't buy all his coffee, so we were kind of paying him much more than what was necessary in the market. Um, in order to help him improve with his economy because he was living on credits. He couldn't finance his own harvest and so on. And I wanted him to you know, build more dryers so we could dry more coffee in shade and so on. Uh, but I learned that you know, when the farmer gets uh, a lot of money, yeah, they <laughs> do invest in the farm, but they invest in the more important things like building a new kitchen because they got to feed 50 workers three times a day building new showers for the ladies so they don't have to shower with the guys, building toilets for the workers, building dormitories, building social areas, buying a television so they can watch the World Cup, and so on. It's taken uh, since 2012, so six years, and now we are finally planning to build a new coffee mill at the farm. And this was the <laughs> intention in 2013, so, you know, it takes time, uh, for reasons that are more important than coffee quality. If the quality of life on the farm isn't good, you know, the quality of the coffee isn't good. And it also has taught me to be patient because working in coffee is not a quick fix. Uh, if you invest in farms, if you, if you start a coffee company, I mean, you might be successful, but you don't start a coffee company to just run it for two years and then get out, unless you want to sell and make a lot of money or something. But if you want to work in the industry, it's, it's a long-term project. And just an example is when we say we change varieties on the farm, that's not done in two years. You know, you've got to plant the seeds. After four years, you might have a small production. You taste that, mm, maybe taste it one more year, and then if it's good, you'll plant more. And then after 10 years, you might have a production of maybe 10 to 20 bags of that coffee. That's how long it takes if you're kind of working in this way. Because I don't want to plant new varieties everywhere and then they fail after four years, you know, because of leaf rust or they don't taste good, you know, you can't risk that. So you've got to be careful. 
All right. I'm going to try to sum up all this uh, blabber. <laughs> so some of the important lessons that I've learned over the years and that I've heard when I've gone to trade shows and so on, uh, I'm going to try to share a little bit with you. Um, first, I was a barista, and everyone told me to probably to make me feel special, but everyone told me that, you know, the barista is the most important part of the coffee chain. We're at the end, you know, the, we're the last person that the consumer meets. Uh, the coffee quality all depends on what we're doing. If we fail in our brewing, the customer will have a bad experience, which is true. But I learned that it doesn't really matter how perfect your extraction is if you're working with a poorly roasted coffee. Um, and so that's why I started roasting. But again, it doesn't really matter if your rate of rice curve is declining all the time, or if it's crashing, or if it's flat all the time. It doesn't matter if you nail the perfect roast, if your green coffee is really bad quality, the coffee won't taste good. And that brings me to the last uh, lesson that uh, is probably the most important one. And that is that good coffee just don't happen by itself. It's produced by people. And by people, I mean my friend Elias. We talk about uh, you know, farmers as being this kind of vague thing, but they're actually people growing coffee. And for me, uh, today I kind of treat Elias as a colleague, as part of my team, because he is. We are working together in order to improve his coffee but I, I don't do it, you know, to, out of charity. I do it because my, my shop kind of depends on it. I'm securing my supply chain more than I'm kind of helping out, if you know what I mean. And by doing this kind of work, it's made my job a lot easier, I would say. Um, it makes roasting a lot easier because you have a predictable product year after year. So I don't have to figure out my roast profiles every year. I can just copy the one from last year and maybe tweak it a little bit. As a green buyer, it's really easy because I don't have to travel all around Colombia to search for the best coffee. I can just go to Elias and cop through his coffees. And yeah, maybe he doesn't have the best coffee in Colombia, but I would say it's probably one of the most consistent ones, which is a good thing. And it's a quality that I like and my customers like. But it's also made me realize that my company is very, very vulnerable. Uh, if this guy disappears, I'll basically be out of business. In the same way that if my employees disappear, I'll be out of business. I won't be able to run my company. Let's just say that I this today decided that I would start paying below minimum wage to all my workers. And if there was someone else around that was willing to work for less, I would fire my workers and, and hire new ones. If I treated my coffee farmers the same way, which we are, most of us, uh, they will be out of business. The same way that I would be out of business if I treat my workers that way. So I think to kind of... Um, repeat what Rick was kind of talking about, that if we forget about the coffee farmers and don't treat them with the respect <coughs> that they deserve, because they're actually doing the hardest job in our industry. I don't know if you know, I've, I'm trying to farm coffee, and I'm exhausted after two weeks. I need a vacation afterwards. So we seriously have to start doing something, because paying below the cost of production is not sustainable, and it's not sustainable for our businesses. So if you can, if you kind of consider your job to be a coffee job, or your business to be a coffee business, just remember that without these guys, uh, there is no coffee. Hence, you don't have a coffee job, and you don't have a coffee business. But let's get some uh, positive vibes in here. Huh? I actually, uh, I do have hope for the industry. I don't think, uh, I think we can change it. And I've experienced as a very, very small company that I, what I have done has changed uh, Elias's life, for sure. Uh, he is now not depending on expensive credits. He has a predictable customer and a predictable future. 
He can plan the air. He doesn't live from week to week. Um, I can make that happen. I can, milk, I can help these guys uh, make a profit so they can invest in the future. I can also uh, commit. You know, I can tell him, you know, I will buy your coffee next year and for the next 10 years, as long as you keep at least the same quality of, uh, of work and quality of coffee. Don't worry about it. I will buy it and I will buy it for a minimum price that is this and so that they have some kind of security. And I think, in my experience at least, that's what they're kind of wanting the most. They want commitment. Because you can, anyone can go to Elias and say, I'll pay double the price. But that doesn't commit to anything. So again, it's not a matter of charity. Uh, for me, it's a matter of securing my supplies and securing the future of my business. And I'd like to, um, to kind of leave you with a, a little thought. Um, the next time you have a cup of coffee <laughs> that you made and it's not maybe to your liking, um, maybe it's not the brewing, maybe it's not the roasting, but maybe there's a bigger problem that you should address and that you can do something about. Thank you very much.